Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 549. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Andrew Gross, and it is November the 13th, 2019. Okay, before we get started with a special episode of Anglican Unscripted, I need you guys to do what you do best, and that's like the show on YouTube and Facebook, that little thumbs thing, you got to click it. Uh, If you've not shared Anglican Unscripted with a significant someone you recently, it's time. Click that uh, link, hyperlink at the top, copy it, put it in your email, and send it off. Let people know about Anglican Unscripted. We appreciate it. Clearly, the, the, the world continues in the comments once we turn the off button on and upload the show. We love how many comments you've been adding to the show. And, you know, there's still commenting on shows we did two weeks ago. We really appreciate that. If you have not subscribed to Anglican TV, Anglican Unscripted up yet, what's your problem? We've been doing this for five or six years. It's time. Take the plunge. Hit the red rectangle button. And if you want to get instant notifications, please click the bell. On the program today, you've seen him before. He's most known for the ponytail. He's now known for the the uh, <clears throat> Calvin slash Eastern Orthodox beard. Is Andrew Gross? There's more You're beard the- than last time. <laughs> There's right. a lot more beard. Uh, you are the communications person for Gafcon and for the ACNA. And from time to time, we have you in the program, especially when we get closer to ACNA events and Gafcon events, to tell us what's going on. You were at the uh, um, Cairo meeting, the Global South meeting uh, last month uh, when they were writing the covenant. And it's a great chance here to update uh, the story uh, Gavin, George, and I did last week with probably some more accurate information. Uh, now that uh, we've uh, uh, seen a bit more posting, uh, we have time now to, to sit down and discuss the bigger implications and uh, kind of the minutia of the, the covenant. So uh, first, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been. Uh, we, I just saw you at New Wineskin, so for you and I, it's not been a while, yeah. but for the audience, like, oh, yeah, 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 the, the beard, you mean, minus the beard, that's Andrew Gross. So It we, is, we, it is yeah. the uh, theological Rorschach test. If you yes. see Calvin or Ridley on the Reform side, if you see Orthodoxy, more on the Orthodox Anglo-Catholic side, so mm-hmm. to each their own. Uh, Unfortunately, far too many people are seeing Amish, so that Amish. doesn't bode well for the long-term <laughs> existence of the beard, but it, it, it's here for today. Okay, good. So let's talk covenant. Now, for the longest yeah. desire in the Anglican Wars, and we're going back 10 or 15 years, there's been what we call next meeting-itis. And what would happen yeah. is the there would be a uh, something happened in the Episcopal Church or in the Anglican Church of Canada, and the primates would either dash off letters uh, into the internet in the blogosphere, or they would have an emergency meeting. And there's Tanzania, there's uh, you know all these different ones that happen in Europe and around the world from 2005 to uh, the formation of GAFCON. And there was always a promise, at least at the Anglican communion level, the Archbishop of Canterbury level, that this next meeting will help resolve the conflicts and we will have a solution and it just never happened we went through a lot of meetings and there was a lot of decisions rightfully made at the primate level but the um what was to be done was handed over to lambeth or was handed over to canterbury and it was it never got done proposed about five years ago six years ago was having a covenant why don't we have some type of doctrinal statement that members sign on to if they want to be part of the Anglican communion? And uh, this was discussed in Jamaica and other places uh, at the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury and ACC level, and it never really got anywhere. Now we have a large group, the Global South, who's proposed a covenant. And the covenant is pretty strong, And it has the one thing that's been missing for the last uh, uh, 400 years of Anglicanism, and that is accountability. That's ecclesial authority built into accountability. And that's special. 
because for the longest time, without strong doctrinal background and uh, you know leaders who just whim this Christianity along, uh, we've watched the Anglican Church and the Anglican Communion suffer greatly. So why don't you tell me a little bit about how this covenant was uh, formed and uh, what what it contains? Sure, I can tell you a little bit uh, about that process and what my experience has been. I think, um, uh, as you mentioned before, I've uh, been involved with GAFCON as the press officer for the last five years, and I'm about as uh, in full on a member of GAFCON as uh, one gets. So, uh, as a GAFCON member, I've been uh, deep in the tank for GAFCON, a huge supporter of GAFCON. And, um, and then I've also been to a lot of the Global South meetings over the last six years, probably the majority of them. So um, part of what has been happening is that each of these groups, GAFCON, as well as the Global South, has been, I think, recognizing that there's work to be done in, uh, within the Anglican Communion. Um, but there's a need to you know, really do the work of structuring our, our lives in such a way in which honors the Bible and honors one another. And so when GAFCON got started, uh, you know, there were, like you said, that next meeting itis had taken place. And a lot of that meeting itis focused on the primates and what the primates council was going to do in Dar es Salaam and in other meetings. And so when GAFCON was formed, it was really led initially by the primates who had recognized that those meetings at the Anglican Communion level weren't bearing fruit. And so they founded GAFCON, uh, Archbishop Akinola from Nigeria, one of the key members of that and other primates that really kind of got that, got GAFCON started. And that was in Jerusalem back in 2008. So that's how GAFCON began. At the time, I think some of the Global South leaders were not quite sure uh, what to make of that. I, I think they were um, not sure about the rhetoric. They weren't sure where GAFCON, what GAFCON was about. And so you did have a group of GAFCON primates and, and leaders, and you had Global South. And that Venn diagram overlapped a lot back then and overlaps to this day. But we've been, we're 10 years further down the road now. So um, when you think about GAFCON and that this renewal movement, proclaiming Christ faithfully to the nations, uh, celebrating a 10-year anniversary, you've got the Global South, which has existed for, um, I think it goes back into the, the 60s, 70s, somewhere yeah. in there, in which it was formed. Uh, and the Global South was a group that was a uh, network founded within the Anglican Communion it, for those that were in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, that wasn't always uh, uh, exactly defined because you had places like Egypt, which are key members of the Global South, uh, but aren't uh, in the Southern Hemisphere per se. But the Global South Anglicans um, uh, have met recently in Cairo, and I was there to, able to be there as observer. And so as a GAFCON member, they're observing what happened. I was really encouraged by what I saw in Cairo. Uh, as you mentioned, there's a covenant in place that has both a theological foundation and a conciliar structure. And uh, those are two things which I think make the Global South healthier and stronger for the years to come. Uh, from a video I watched of Phil Ashley, he said that Bob Duncan, after signing this, said, this is the strongest statement since the formation of Lambeth Conference. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, so this is kind of the biggest news of the Anglican Communion that hasn't got a lot of press. Uh, it flew under the radar screen, that's fair it, to say. Coming out it, of Cairo, it wasn't uh, widely talked about uh, as it probably should have been. The first time I paid attention to it was on Steve Knoll's blog when he says, you know, GAFCON's nice too. Uh, is, this some, is this a threat at all to GAFCON? I think what's important for folks to realize is that the GAFCON primates are all Global South primates as well. And so um, there's not a, a rift or a divide between GAFCON and the Global South. Um, the covenant that was just passed with this conciliar structure in the Global South was passed by the Primates Council unanimously and on the steering committee for the Global South. Uh, almost every member of the steering committee, with the exception of one, is also a GAFCON primate. So what we've seen over the last 10 years, I think both GAFCON has gotten stronger and the Global South has gotten stronger. And that's good for global Anglican orthodoxy in general. And you've got leaders that have been building bridges between the two organizations. As I said, the primates are, are part of the GAFCON primates are part of both organizations. And so uh, there's really a complementary work that they're doing together. 
as opposed to competition or um, any sort of rivalry. Rowan Williams wrote a, uh, an opinion letter about what Anglicanism is, and he said it's diocese to diocese relationships. One of the things I see in this uh, covenant is that proposal all over again. You know, it doesn't work forever at the primate level. It doesn't work forever at the province level. But the best bet you have going as a, is at the diocesan level. Um, that's new and interesting as, as far as I'm concerned. It is. And I think if you look at the Global South document, you'll see that it's not obviously the diocesan level is key but there's also a place for provinces to opt in and there's a place for networks to opt in which might be a network that's um, a network of dioceses or that's um uh, that's below the diocesan level so there's different ways in which folks can opt into that structure and it's one of the things that i think gafcon has also been working at uh, i think the legitimately there was the the criticism and the recognition that gafcon was founded by primates that saw a problem but it also led to some fragility. So when a primate changed in a province, it could be that that province as a whole suddenly seemed to cease to be part of GAFCON. So GAFCON's done a lot of work, done a lot of work in the last couple of years to also go deeper beyond the primates level. So there's a bishop's training institute that really works with bishops to provide quality theological training. There's also the Kigali Conference for Bishops that's coming up in June. And then there's also networks that GAFCON has formed, which go below the level of bishops. And those um, are things like sustainable development and church planting, and they network together uh, leaders, both lay leaders and clergy leaders, to really bring GAFCON down to the grassroots level. So I think on the GAFCON side, the fragility of a organization built to, upon a prime that was recognized, and GAFCON's addressed that. At the Global South side, they've also recognized that uh, there needs to be depth built into these systems. And so part of what happened in Cairo was that the Primates Council unanimously uh, passed this covenantal uh, theological structure. But then that was passed on to delegates that were there from around the world, uh, a little over 100 delegates at the room. And the delegates passed the uh, covenant, and they passed it with just two abstentions, no one voting against, everybody else voting in favor of it. But there was also the recognition that as delegates there for the conference, they could uh, pass that uh, structure. But it's up to the provinces then to opt into it. And so for the Global South, uh, the next 18 months in particular are going to be key, where each province has the opportunity to go back through their own uh, synodical processes in their churches and their provinces and opt into that Global South structure. So while this structure has been passed, there's currently uh, no members of the Global South Covenant structure yet. Um, each of them, the you know, provinces and dioceses and networks, have the opportunity to opt in. So you see on both sides, GAFCON and the Global South, um, working hard to make sure that they're built for the long term and the long haul and that things go beyond the level of primates and bishops but work their way down to laity and clergy. Canterbury. Now for the Global South, yeah. the long-term relationship with Canterbury was essential. Listen, we're not going to do anything, and this is uh, Global South up to this recent Cairo meeting, that is going to uh, fracture our relationship with the uh, Sea of Canterbury. We need the street cred. Um, we need the Archbishop's um, uh, not oversight, but you know we need him uh, coming to the party. Gafcon, what was formed, says we would love the Archbishop to come alongside us in all this. We would love to have something going forward with him, but that's up to him. You know, it, we, it, from what I could see, it, it's, it wasn't a take it or leave it, but um, a future with Canterbury was not necessary anymore. Uh, I'm not way off base there, right? No, that's fair. That's fair, okay. So, in this formation of a covenant, are they kind of saying now that, you know, Canterbury is not maybe part of the long-term solution for a the Anglican communion. I think when it comes to uh, Canterbury and the other instruments of communion, Anglican communion, the covenant that you see that comes out of the Global South, as I read it, again, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I've been paying pretty close attention to that, uh, is that the 
it really cares about what the internal life of members of the global south is going to look like. What theological statements um, are we committed to? What common life are we committed to? And so uh, there isn't much reference to uh, the instruments of communion outside of the global south. And so how they'll relate to those instruments is, is up uh, to the future. Uh, we'll see how that, that looks like. But what came out of Cairo was, um, what does our common life look like together? Uh, because in the past, what it meant to be a member of the Global South, there was some historic ties within the Anglican Communion, and you were typically close to the Southern Hemisphere. And that was it. There was no conciliar structure. There was no confessional statement. There was no theological foundation per se. Those were uh, rather assumed. So the assumptions have been taken out and have been now been put into writing. Um, but they're really focused on the internal life of the global south. And, and on the GAFCON side, GAFCON has also uh, built structure into itself as well now. there's in, in Jerusalem, there was a synodical council that was formed for the first time with delegates from each of the different uh, provinces as well as the primates involved. So uh, both organizations, GAFCON and the global south, uh, I think are really uh, sending down deeper roots uh, that can try to uh, stand the test of time. Now, the Global South has uh, key Americans involved though, in it as well, uh, Archbishop uh, Bob Duncan, uh, Phil Ashey, and some others. Uh, that's notable because, well, they're not Global South uh, by the original definition. Um, is that something we're going to see more of in the future? Well, they've been Global South for the last couple of years. Folks may not have recognized that the Anglican Church in North America was uh, brought into the Global South as a partner province a couple of years ago. And so uh, Archbishop Duncan, as well as Canon Ashey, have been working with uh, Bishop Renis Panaya of Singapore and Dr. Michael Poon of Singapore. Uh, other members of the, the team that were working on the covenant were Sami Shahada, Bishop Sami Shahada from uh, Egypt, as well as uh, uh, Bishop David Anoha from uh, Nigeria. So it was a good representation from around the world. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the Global South um, initially in the Southern Hemisphere, but then had uh, folks in the Northern Hemisphere involved with it, uh, is continuing to kind of offer fellowship to those that um, have a commonality in the gospel. From the 30,000 foot level again, I've been to uh, Global South, uh, South of South Encounter uh, in Singapore, and there was a lot of noise and a lot of papers and a lot of proposals uh, put forth there and at other meetings, and there was just never any follow-up. Um, I call it, in my own opinion, I called it a, a paper tiger, so to speak. Um, I suspect this covenant is going to be different, that there will be some follow-up and it's going to be a working document within the global south what's your opinion well i think the it goes back to the provinces now for follow-up and so mm -hmm. i think everyone waits to see how many provinces opt choose to opt in uh you have bishop renis panaya and uh, some of his staff that are really going to be driving things forward so that's encouraging there's uh bishop renis is fantastic as many of our viewers know and mm -hmm. so he'll really be spearheading the process with folks like canon ashy and and others um to uh answer questions that folks might have and help the process forward so i think that's good i think uh, again from a gafcon perspective where i sit um it's it's good to have more strength and health uh, built into each of our different Anglican groupings, whether it's GAFCON, the Global South, whether it's something like Kappa, which is a group of uh, African mm -hmm. uh, Anglican um, um, uh, provinces. I think uh, for all of them to get stronger is good for all of us. GAFCON uh, has gone into New Zealand, has gone into uh, uh, South America, has gone into England. Uh, the Global South is not likely to do that in the near future, uh, from what I can see. Uh, do you think that's going to uh, cause any uh, consternation in the future at all? Well, see, I think it's one of the ways in which uh, you can see GAFCON's complementary gifting. I think GAFCON has a prophetic gifting and a boldness to do things like care for the, new, the faithful New Zealand. That's really necessary and, and critical. And so, um, you know, one could foresee how this diocese in New Zealand um, that GAFCON has called into existence because the faithful there needed a diocese, needed a faithful way of fellowship, can now uh, 
opt into becoming part of the global south as well. So I think there's going to be ways in which GAFCON, the global south, and their complementary callings are going to be working closer and closer together. And I think that's part of what's really encouraging about where we're at is there's been a lot of bridge building between leadership in the global south and GAFCON. And as we said before, a lot of overlap already. Um, So you'll see more and more cooperation. All right, let's take off your GAFCON hat, put your ACNA hat on, ACNA hat, sorry, and tell me, uh, are we going to recommend to the diocese here in the ACNA that they sign on to the Global South uh, Covenant? I think you can expect that for the Provincial Council, uh, the Provincial Council of the Anglican Church of North America taking up um, uh, the covenant uh, coming up in this next June. So uh, if we as a whole province opt in, that leaves the diocese don't necessarily need to. Uh, So I'm expecting you'll hear more from Canon Ashi and others about um, the process we'll go through in our canons uh, to opt into that covenant. I'm out of questions. Uh, Anything I need to follow up with, Andrew? I think we've covered a lot of ground. Like I you do, said, yeah. it's deep inside baseball. This is Probably inside baseball. Well, it's point. really but important. For those that are really yeah. Anglican geeks, yeah. this has been your episode. So. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really important because, uh, like we said, you know, this is two months old information and it, it just didn't get the play that it normally would. When you guys were having your meeting uh, for the Global South to South, there weren't 15 news crews outside like there would have been 10 years ago. Uh, the secular press has given up on the Anglican Wars. Um, the BBC will do something once in a while. Uh, the Washington Post on, on a slow news day will put up a story. That's it. And so uh, if Unscripted doesn't find it in the news or Anglican Inc. doesn't hit it, it's not going to show anywhere. And so, uh, and if I remember correctly, uh, Global South, they don't have a press agent like the wonderful Andrew Gross. Uh <laughs> they're working on uh, they're working putting together it. a secretariat. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're we're all a work in progress, right? Yeah, yes, we are. <laughs> all right, so I uh, hope we got everybody updated on the uh, uh, now. It's w- the documents of this proposed covenant that I read. Uh, it is a covenant that was agreed to at the primatial level. Yeah, what's the how official? Do- it's just being sent out now, right? It is yeah, a so working it was covenant. Passed, it was passed by the primates and it was passed by the delegates. Okay, I wanted to be sure I got that straight. Because the copy yeah, I was so sent still says proposed. Okay, all right, good. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Andrew, for your help. I'm Kevin Carlson. Hey, thanks, Kevin. I'm Andrew and Gross. You, and you've been watching Anglican Unscripted, if I can remember correctly, episode 549. I leave for vacation this week, and if we get a chance, we'll do some taping down in Florida with everybody. Um, look forward to that next week, and I hope to have an interview with uh, Ken and Phil Ashy with more details about the covenant and the ecclesial accountability. Ooh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs>